loving what you're hearing? Well, the establishment hates it. And right now, they're conjuring up new ways to try and censor RCR. To ensure you never miss a beat of the hard-hitting news you've come to know and love, make sure you're on the RCR mailing list. Get connected now at realitycheck.radio forward slash email. Morris Williamson is a current Auckland councillor, a former national MP, and he was the Consul General to Los Angeles, as well as being a good friend. He's on the line now to discuss the mindset of American politics from a perspective of someone who represented New Zealand, and I'll ask him about the latest goings-on in the Auckland Council. Welcome back to The Crunch, this time at breakfast, uh, Morris. Good to have you back. Very good to be back. I thought I'd get you on to talk about a couple of things. Um, Firstly, what's going on in the United States. I mean, you used to be the Consul General for New Zealand in Los Angeles. So you've probably got a, a bit of a feel about how people think and, and operate around politics in, in the US. And the second thing we'll do is touch on what's happening at Auckland Council and the revelations about the growth of road cones. <laughs> <laughs> they like the dialects. Yeah, so let, let's just talk about the US. Um, it's an, been an incredible two weeks. First of all, we had the attempted assassination of uh, Donald Trump, and there's all sorts of theories out there about what went on. And and fortunately, I mean, this is an event that's had literally thousands of people with phones videoing, and there's an analysis of sound and all sorts of things you've never seen before uh, looking into things. That upended the, the presidential campaign. Then we saw President Joe Biden announce that he's ill, and he's withdrawing from the race, but he's still going to be the president in the interim and in endorsing Kamala Harris. What's your view on this, having sat in the United States for, I don't know, five years or so, admittedly in the Socialist Democratic Republic of California, but uh, it gives you an insight anyway. Yeah, I did. I was responsible for 11 states, so that did include things like Arizona and Colorado, which were a little less... Uh, to the left of of the extreme that California can be. Uh, I I always like to try to say to people, there is no such country as the United States. There are 50 very separate countries. And they, if you are in Oklahoma and talking to people there, and then you are in New Hampshire and talking to people there, you literally wouldn't believe it was the same country. Their, Their thoughts and their views are so extremely different. So I guess the first thing to get to everybody's head is that this does not come down to being a national election. You can forget nearly all of the states. They will all go the same way as they do. The number of voting delegates to the Electoral College will be given. And it's really down to the swing states, to the Michigans, Wisconsin's. Um, Nevada and Arizona are now in that mix. Pennsylvania, I've got seven um and Georgia has moved into my seven of the swing states. When Donald Trump got elected in 2016, I think it was 55,000 people, which is less than the number of voters in the Pakaranga electorate, determined the presidency in those swing states. Mm-hmm. Had they voted another way, you would have flipped a couple of them. The Electoral College numbers would have gone. So there's a big magnifier in the outcome based on Electoral College. I, I, I think the world finally saw an election result delivered to you the night of the debate. Um, Halfway through the debate, I turned to my wife and I said, that's all over. It's all finished. Biden's gone. And she said, oh, he'll try to hang on. I said, no, no, you cannot turn in a performance like that where you literally didn't know who you were, what you were and where you were. And your opponent was able to say, well, I didn't know what he even said and I don't think he did. And there was real merit to it. It's just a tragedy that a country that is, in my view, the greatest nation on the planet can also be the worst nation on the planet yeah. for, just, for just its political management. I think the Democratic Party officials uh, need a, a, a good horse whipping because they've allowed something that was clearly not functional for a long time to just sort of fester on and fester on and to have a a scene at the end of that debate where Joe Biden's wife is saying, you did really well, Joe, you answered all the questions 
like he was a little kid at primary school and she's giving him a little pat on the head and maybe an apple. Um, I, I don't think there's now a, a, a question about the election outcome. I think Trump will win the election comfortably no matter what uh, the Democrats put together as a whoever their ticket will be. I think there's enough endorsements now to guarantee Kamala Harris will get the presidential nomination. And it's a matter of which one of the, what I've got five or six governors in play and at least one Senator Mark Kelly in play. But I just think it's all over Rover for them. And I think, uh, you know, you can tell people, you heard it on your channel first this Thursday morning that the outcome of the result will be a President Trump return to power. I looked also at the stand-up that Biden did after the NATO conference, and I thought it was cruel and unusual yeah. to yeah. Put him through that, and he was, again, all at sea. Uh, I mean, that's a little bit like what they used to do with popes. They yeah. used to be popes that were so old they couldn't stand, and they would wheel them out and get them to lift their hand and, and wave to the crowd, and you kept saying, this is just wrong. Stop it right now. There is a time, and Muhammad Ali was like that as a boxer. He was, in my view, the greatest boxer in, on the planet, and he got to a point where he was just standing there shaking, couldn't stand properly and going on, I am the greatest. It's actually cruel, and if these people had had any sense, they would have said early on, you know, you're, you're slipping down the ladder very quickly. We've got to find a way to exit you out of here. Uh, and he actually had said himself at the beginning of the 2020, uh, when he got in, that this would be a transition presidency in order to bring new blood through and so on. So there would have been no dishonour or disgrace to just doing the one term in order to do the transition. But I guess power corrupts and all power corrupts absolutely. And uh, mm -hmm. he saw it as a really good opportunity to, um, you know, do a second term. And it was, I, I watched some of the stuff. Do you see the clips of him coming off? Air Force One and and walking those steps and so on. It's almost the people that are arranging it were just being really, really cruel. It's it's like the Soviet Union used to do with, you know, leaders like Brezhnev who yeah. or, or Yuri Andropov who was oh, they, some of them were really old who was reportedly dead for months before they announced it. <laughs> you know? uh, it, it. It's almost weekend at Bernie's if it wasn't just so cruel for somebody who has spent a lifetime. Uh, you know, in in uh, Congress and the Senate. Correct. But if you think of the big decisions a president makes, I mean, I've been in the cabinet for some years and I know that we get a lot of decisions that are quite tough and there's a lot of backroom meetings and so on. And yet New Zealand's a little minnow player. So we haven't got that big world, uh, you know, let's go to war and blow the entire planet up stuff. That's on their books. If you think of the guy that couldn't even stand there and he, and, it, and, it, and it dates way, back way before the debate. He, he did things like standing on a platform somewhere, calling up one of the local congresswomen to come and say hello, and they had to sort of say to him, Joe, she, she died three months ago. Oh, 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 that's right, she died, yes. And if you think of that level of, of, of cognitive awareness, and then you put in front of him a huge big combinatorics and permutation maps of the options for, you know, what's Putin doing in Ukraine and what are we going to do about this and that. You, you know that he hasn't obviously been president for that period of time. He has been literally others doing all that work and he's just been sort of nodding in the chair. It's tragic. It's a sad demise, really. Yeah, it's a tragic thing to happen. And um, I guess that's the one... I've always had this line I use that my favourite All Black of all time was Graham Murray. He was a fantastic All Black. He was an amazing captain. He was just a player beyond belief. And one day at the very peak of his career, when everyone thought he had several years to go, he said, that's it, I'm retiring. Bang, gone. And yeah. I've never held more respect for anybody who recognised they were at the peak of their ability They'd done everything they wanted to. There was no more to achieve, and he left. Um, I'm seeing a bit of the opposite of that to, uh, on the news this day because I've been watching some of the, the golf. And Tiger Woods, who was indeed, in my view, the best, great, greatest golfer ever, is still in there, and he's just slip missing the cut, and it's not working. And, he's, and he, it can't be for the money because he's worth hundreds of millions, and it can't be for anything else. Please just know when your time is up and, and, and enjoy your retirement. I remember um, Max Bradford saying to me 
uh, you know, at the end of the Bulgy years, uh, he said, oh, it's really strange. He says, I walk down the main street of Wellington and nobody talks to me. In fact, I've seen people who I know really well who are crossing the road and, and <laughs> I don't know what it's about. And I said to him, Max, it's because you're losing. Yeah, it's also that, you know, in politics, if you, especially if you're a minister, you know, you're a rooster today and a feather duster tomorrow. Um, you know, you're, you've got my phone never stopped. People wanting to, oh, you know, invite you to a meal and we go to the rugby together and so on. And I got some really good advice from an old, crusty old national minister once called Warren Cooper. He <laughs> says, just let me tell you, young boy, let me tell you, young fella, Williamson, you'll be a minister in the new government and you'll get excited about the number of people who are your friends. And they'll want to be chatting to you and there'll be dinners and, you know, can we meet you and take you to the rugby and so on. And you just need to know that one day when the result of the election is the opposite, you'll be hard pressed up against the glass watching all the officials and everyone walking into the other building to meet the new minister. They'll have the exact same greeting. Minister, good to have you on board. Looking forward to working with you. And your phone will just stop. So don't be upset about it. It's just the way the world is. And the moment you begin to think that you're something special, or that you're really important, you've lost the plot. As I said, you're a rooster today and you're a feather duster tomorrow in that game. So the Democrats look like they're coalescing around Kamala Harris. Is that going to change the outcome, do you think? Yeah, I think they will. I mean, I don't think they know what to do because of the short time frame. We've only seen, I think there's only two presidents of modern history, anyway, uh, that have bailed out after one term. And that was obviously, well, uh, both of them actually had part terms, from what I understand. Lyndon Johnson had a part term and then he had the term. And um, uh, who was it that took over at the end of the Second World War uh, when Roosevelt died? Uh, Truman. He he ended up with a one term and then he walked. But they all left in the very early part of the election year, those two. They left in, I think, March. They were both gone by. This is now coming up August in a week's time when the one convention's held and the other party's holding their convention, it's going to be really interesting to see how they do it. They, they're they scared witless of the, of the mantle that she was just given a coronation and just handed it because that will cost her badly with the voters. So I see even she's saying now she'll have to fight to win the support of the delegates and it'll be a contest and so on. I don't think it will be. I think you'll find that uh, the backroom boys, I I know a number of people in both political parties because I had a lot of contact with them up there. I think they'll be moving heaven and earth to get her wheeled in. They'll be working. uh, I think it's either going to be Governor Andy Bashir from Kentucky. Uh, I go with maybe uh, Ray Cooper from North Carolina. Josh Shapiro from Pennsylvania, or finally, those are all governors, or a senator, Mark Kelly from Arizona. They always seem to pick the vice president candidate that is that balance. You know, and as I said, John Kennedy had uh, Lyndon Johnson. One was North, one was South, one was old, one was young, one was conservative, one was liberal, um, because you want to have that balance of the ticket. There has been a lot of talk on the media that she'll be looking to pick a running mate that will be able to bring their state across the line. But if you go and do the analytics that I've done, very few people have ever bought their own state across the line unless it already was. She's a Democrat. California's a Democrat state. She didn't bring the state across and didn't increase the vote. It's- no, no. And that will be the case. There, there may be one of your, your political uh, operatives who really know their stuff might be able to find one or two cases. But I've got a, a lot of examples where you know, people put in someone to be their their um, vice presidential nominee, and it didn't make any real difference, even in the vice president nominee's state, let alone elsewhere. I mean, like, it's so incredible how little known they are. Ask, ask your listeners uh, today, I mean, who was Jimmy Carter's vice president? No idea. Yeah. Even I don't know. <laughs> Alder Mondale. He was picked to try to give the balance of north and south and east and west and and tall and short. And in the gender stakes, you can't even have that balance now because it's not binary anymore. There's not male and female. It's one of anything. So who knows what might happen there? Yeah, I, those people that you named as potential vice president picks for Kamala Harris, nobody's ever heard of them. You know, no, that's the, the, again, in American politics, 
Actually, it's true here in sort of our local politics. If you look at the number of people that have got onto the Auckland Council, for example, uh, have been people like Dick Quacks, the runner, or John Walker, the runner, uh, or a rugby player, or a whatever. Uh, people that are well known, if their name is well known, uh, and you know Arnold Schwarzenegger winning the governorship of of California, and um, that's just because there's such a well-known name. You, people go to the polls and will vote for a name they know. If you'd ask people, if you'd ask people across the United States, other than in Kentucky, who's Andy Bashir, no one would know. I mean, just no one. The people of Kentucky would know. If you asked, even Gretchen Whitmer in, um, I think you can rule her out in Michigan because I don't think you could have a ticket that was too female. So I, uh, people keep saying, oh, she's a possibility, but. It would be a complete devastation if you went with both candidates being female. Yeah, I, I, look, it's harder to pick than a broken nose, I guess, for the Democrats. <laughs> a way forward for them because um, you know the tragedy of of Joe Biden and the inanity of K Kamala Harris don't add up to victory. What what I also think is the sort of the the, the big subterfuge is you'll hear the Democrats saying, you know, he's been the greatest president, you know, we've ever had. What he's achieved is outstanding, the best economy, uh, the best outcomes. And all I can tell you is if you talk to people in the street up there, which I do, I've been back a few times and I've talked to people by cell phone quite a lot, that, you know, they are suffering just as much as we are from the cost of living crisis. They are hurting up there. There are forced mortgagee sales. There are people struggling to fill the tank with gas or pay for groceries. Those are the things that matter to how you vote. And if that's hurting people, they will vote you out. And I think her biggest weakness by a million miles will have been that she was appointed to this really big job title after she became vice president of the czar of the southern border, and she was going to go down yeah. there and clean it up. Now, had she done so, she'd have been almost a superhero in the eyes of the Americans to have actually dealt to it and fixed it and so on. What it ended up with was way worse than had they done nothing and there were just people flooding across the border daily, being given Prezi cards and hotel rooms in New York, and the American public just got, I, I can tell you, I've got some quite liberal friends in California who you'd normally say would be on the on the end of what, what Kamala Harris was doing was fine, saying this is just outrageous. And uh, if she was put through a performance uh, assessment of how well she did, she didn't even go down to the border uh, for a whole, I think, for the first couple of years. So you know, if I was put in charge of the ports of Auckland or something, I think the very first day after I was appointed, I'd go to the ports and sit in the office for a few days and say, I want to see the books, I want to go through the data, I want to see this, I want to... So she's not got this great track record, although they will talk up a big game of... It won't work with the public if they're hurting. And not uh, in those states. I mean, the Texas governor has been, you know, bussing and flying all these immigrants to the uh, sanctuary cities yes. and the sanctuary cities are now bursting at the seams and going, well, what's going on? Well, all of those sanctuary cities who said all of that are on the border of Canada, not on the border of Mexico. Yes. But in the end, I've always had this theory that, you know, people don't vote on whether you've changed the flag or people don't vote on gay marriage uh, or whatever. They, they vote on one or two simple things, their hip pocket, and their kids' future. And, and when so they wake up in the morning and they put their feet on the floor beside the bed, things shoot through their mind, like, is my job safe or is that talk we're going to big big layoffs and I might be able to work within a month? That's what matters to them and that's what they vote on. Uh, secondly, there's a black mole on my wife's shoulder. Is that a melanoma? And if so, will the health system look after her or will she be a waiting list and die of cancer waiting uh, are my kids getting a, a schooling that will set them up for the world of the future and be able to participate, or will they end up just being a, a cleaner at some place because they've got no quality? There's about three or four things. It's about health and education. It's about law and order, and mm -hmm. it's about hip pocket stuff. If, if you think of all of those, if you think of the law and order stuff in the United States, if you think of the education system and its, and its standard of delivery right now, you, 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 and the healthcare. I mean, he goes on. Oh, I've made inhalers only thirty-five dollars. I'm sorry, the health system up there is stuffed. 
literally mm. stuffed in terms of its costs and explosion and the billions that insurance will cost and the companies making fortunes. I don't think there's people wandering around there to say, wow, he's really fixed the health system. That is fantastic. So I, I'm I'm telling you, I will repeat it again. I think you can say that on the 20, no, what is it, the 6th of January, or whenever the date will be, uh, you'll be seeing a, a 47th President Donald Trump sworn in as also. This only happened ever once. There's only ever been one president ever that was, I think, the 22nd and the 24th. Uh, can't remember who it was now. Grover Cleveland, I think, is the one that went back a second time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's going to be some big changes uh, coming up in the US, but uh, let's move on to all oh, I, Can I do one last thing? My, my, I'm really worried about the weakened USA right now and right through until middle of January, whatever the swearing date will be, I'm really worried that what you'll see is the the opponents to the United States cribbing a whole lot of ground and making a whole lot of pressure push. You know, Putin will now be strengthened for what he does in the Ukraine. Xi Jinping will be way more strengthened to take action into, into Taiwan or the South China Seas. Uh, it's a shame that because for the next six months you're going to have not just a lame duck president, which you often have, but you'll almost have a dead duck president in place. Yeah, it'll be a tragedy. Yeah, Auckland Council, Morris, what's going on there? I see that there's some revelations about the sea of road cones that everyone experiences. Yeah, a lot of that's got to do with central government. It, it went back to national government to start with after the Pike River uh, explosion, and then they had this big review of health and safety in the workplace. And the recommendations were, in my view, way over the top, way, way extreme compared to what the requirement was. Uh, and I actually announced publicly that I would cross the floor and vote against the things like corporate manslaughter, which finally the National Party pulled out of, because you were going to go to jail if someone died in your company, uh, even if you'd provided them with all the safety equipment and briefings and everything else. What happened was we then found out that instead of being able to stick a road cone at the beginning of a street and say, you know, water main fixing, and people just drove around it, you had to put 475,000 road cones up every side street. You had to have people with stop-go signs so someone could get a spanner out and untighten up the nuts on a water main leak. And it's now got to be to the point where it's laughable. The, the best example I can ever give you is because my mum was really ill in Waikato Hospital at the end of last year, I was up and down to Hamilton every second day. And your listeners will know about this, but State Highway 1 around Rangariri which normally would have been 110 and is back to 100, had just cones and signs up for five months saying 70K. Nobody, nobody adhered to it. Everyone still drove at 110, so they were all breaking the law. And there was no work. The people that were going to lay the chip seal weren't ready and they couldn't get a contract. And so they just left all of them, the cones up and all the 70K sign up. And the New Zealand Transport Agency needed to absolutely have a flogging over that because it is just, you know, and that's what I think the mayor's really going for it about. Let's have a regime where if you abuse the privilege of being able to put road cones to block off something when it's necessary and vital, and then you just leave them there for several days with no work going on, you, you'll pay a big price for that. And I, I'm a big fan of that. I, it's spreading everywhere, though, because in the apartment building where I where I live, uh, there was a guy doing some work on a hand sanitizer on the wall. <laughs> he had seven cones yep. and the little barrier things that put over the top yep. and a warning sign and tape so that he could screw on and screw off this hand sanitizer. And, and I stood there and you know, I said to the property manager who was standing there watch, supervising, you know, hands on hips, mm -hmm. I said, so we've got road cones infesting the building now. Yep. And he said, well, you know, it's health and safety. I said, it's bollocks. Of you know, course it is. I mean, like, no one wants to see people injured in the workplace and no one wants to see people. Trip over the road cones. But, 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 but just realistically, you know, people drown in the bath every year. Should we outlaw baths and have a government agency going house to house, ripping them out, and you'd be prosecuted if you're found to have a bath 
And you'll probably, and everyone laughs when you say that to them in an audience. You say, well, it's just how crazy it is. There will be people die on our roads. There will be people who die from an airplane crash or whatever. You, you've got to understand there is a, a risk associated with every human activity. What you've got to try and do is have safety at reasonable cost. Uh, my wife, Raywin, pointed to me last night that pointed out to me that something she remembers there used to be trucks where guys could hang off the side of them and hand down and pick up the cones, one, two, three, and would come along at the end of the day and pick all the cones up and put them back on the truck and the next morning go out and relay them. So it meant that the roads were all clear for use when they weren't doing work at them. Now they'll leave the site without any work for weeks, if not months. And that Rangariri State Highway 1 was months. No work, but just inconvenience the public because no incentive. And by the way, what they're paying to rent an orange cone would make your head spin. I just wish that when I was a young man, I'd wanted to get into the orange cone manufacturing because I would be a multi, multi-millionaire now. I mean, it, there is ludicrous um, rules. I mean, take swimming pool fences. It was a case, this isn't in the far north, so it's not in Auckland Council, but it just exact, shows you the, the absolute stupidity of bureaucrats. There's yep. an, a remote island somewhere near the Cavalli Islands. Yep. There's three houses on the island. It's privately owned. Yep. And the owners put in a pool at the high tide mark. And the council has flown over it, has photographed it, has sent out five people to survey, yep. and then served an abatement notice to the owners saying you need to fence your pool. When if you walk off the edge of the pool and the surround, you're in the ocean. You're two meters from the ocean. <laughs> but but Cameron, there's there's ripper examples. One in Cambridge once was a, a farmer being absolutely persecuted for the no proper fencing around the swimming pool, and just across the paddock, a little way, only you know fifty meters across the paddock, was a huge horse trough swimming pool where they trained the horses with a rope on either side and they walk them into the deep pool and then they get them just using their legs and so on and that didn't have to be fenced and you just go oh come on that's a huge pool of water and you don't have to but this one here where I live along the Rotary walkway around Pakaranga and the, you've got the Tamaki River right there there are all these houses that drop down straight at the back of the at the back of this section you drop straight down into the river and there's no need to have any of that fenced. But if you've got a swimming pool up on your property, that has to be. So it's, again, I, I'm a big fan of stopping kids from drowning and doing things that make sense and trying to stop things. But th th like everything, these rules just go over the top. And I am delighted that the mayor's just said, you know, enough's enough. Good news that Simeon Brown, the minister, agrees with him totally, unlike Michael Wood, who was, uh, you know, almost the, the orange cone king of the country. And they are hopefully are going to do something. And as Brown, well, but they're both Brown, Mayor and Minister Brown, but Mayor Brown is saying what you need is some penalties against the contracting companies who just, when they close up at the day, couldn't give a stuff at what inconvenience they're causing. There's no penalty to them. Why would they bother? Well, how about there are some really severe penalties if you just leave a site all blocked and stopped and you can't move around or the public can't move around, uh, but you didn't need to because there's no work going on. Well, that's the problem is we elect politicians like Michael Wood, whose sole work experience was knowing how to measure an inside seam at Hugh Wright's. And then they yeah, put these big jobs and they don't know how to do it. And his latest uh, thing, he's now apparently working in a in a Labor, uh, Labor MP's office, but he's now a spokesperson for some new fangled gun control organisation. And I'd suggest he's never handled a gun in his life. Well, I mean, his his speed limit reduction stuff, it's got to be thought about. You know, we're trying in council right now to uh, either back or, or argue against the, the minister's proposal for things like school zones. And they're arguing, no, we should have 30K past a school no matter what, no matter where. Now, the first thing they haven't taken account of is there's about 12 weeks of the year the schools don't sit. So let's mm. multiply just the weekdays there. So you've got five weekdays times 12, that's 60 days. You've yeah. then got 52 weeks of the year where there's no school on two of those days. So that's another 104. We're about 180, I think, with statutories and others, about 180 days where the school doesn't even meet. And yet you're telling me that everybody driving past those on the 180 days, which is nearly half the year, basically, you're telling me people driving past those 
They've got to stuck at 30K when there's no kids, there's no school, there's no danger. Or what about a tradie leaving home at 5 a.m. to go off to work somewhere, goes past a school, it was 30K, he did 50. There was no kids because kids don't come for another three hours yet. Uh, and the cops didn't ping them. So it's just insanity. Again, what I want them to focus on is, is there a problem? Like if kids were getting killed at my local school, my local three, my kids all went to, uh, to Sunny Hills Primary. If there was kids getting injured or killed there, I'd be first one to want to do something about safety. But they did. The AT came in and did this massive amount of roundabouts and cones, and they completely disrupted everything. And when you asked how many serious uh, crashes or, or deaths had occurred, the answer was none and none. <laughs> and you go, so what was it? The problem you were trying to solve again? No, oh, exactly. We we see this all the time. We're we're really up against time now, Morris. I've okay. uh, got this morning uh, slots giving me a bit of sweat. You know, having to. <laughs> having to fill in for Paul Brennan, but thank you for so much for coming on. And we'll My pleasure. Have a good day. Thank you. There's some really good insights there from Morris, and he's a political tragic like I am. There's still a long way to go until November and lots more water to pass under the American political bridges before then. What do you think? Email inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thank you for tuning in to RCR, Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to or dislike what you're listening to, either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057, that's 2057, or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you, so connect with us today.